Welcome, and thank you for joining us today as we talk about SOC reporting and the impact that COVID-19 coronavirus has had or can potentially have on audit reports. What we want to do in order to, for today's audience is to talk briefly about uh, the impacts of SOC reporting and uh, in light of coronavirus. And these impacts can vary widely based upon a specific service organization and how the coronavirus might have, might have impacted them. So it, what we really want to encourage at the onset is that any service organization uh, that's anticipating performing a SOC report this year step back and ask some really pertinent questions, really beginning with a self-reflection about what impact has happened as a result of the business and its market. And in particular, has that had some form of impact on the internal controls that the business operates? And this can come in many forms. It can come in the form of changes to the workforce, whether the workforce is now working remotely and what that transition was like in the potential transactional and, and business process changes that happened as a result of that. In situations where there's reduced, reduced hours, furloughs, turnover, social distancing, travel restrictions, we know that this can really impact how people perform their work, when they perform their work, how they perform their work, really who does specific functions. And at the end of the day, because people are so closely tied into the control environment, it can create situations in which controls have changed, they've ceased to operate for a period of time, or they've just gone away altogether. And in those cases, that can erode evidence, it can, it can eliminate uh, actual performance of a control, it can mean that people are not monitoring to make certain that activities are continuing to be performed as expected. And really, uh, some of the ways to offset that are considered in what degree automated and manual controls can counterbalance each other and potentially have been put into place already. So one of these aspects is a reflective component. What are, where are we at today and how do we get here based around coronavirus? And then in, from a future perspective, asking ourselves the question, how we adjusted or what further adjustments can we make to how people perform their duties, whether it's putting in new uh, duties, shifting around responsibilities of who does what functions to make sure tasks have not gone away and checkpoints have not been eroded, and then where necessary modifying segregated duties to account for changes or even uh, reduced number of people performing job functions so that the intent and the spirit of internal controls remain solid. And then uh, as a counter check, their monitoring controls do allow us to go back and service organization to check to make sure things are continue to be performed. And we, we do see concern that uh, monitoring activities may in fact be one of those areas that could be susceptible to not being performed when, uh, when people are focusing on mission critical operations. And a footnote, because service organizations don't operate in a vacuum, there certainly needs to be consideration of their associated service organizations, subservice organizations and vendors, the other parties of what they operate with and how they may in fact influence the internal control environment that's under audit and consequently what considerations need to be taken into account for them. So it's one of the first things that needs to be done is to understand the impacts of COVID and where it could have an influence for different parties. So a SOC audit is performed by the, on a service organization by the service auditor. And for us, uh, what we're looking at with our clients is to, is to, in fact, step back and ask the question, have business and operations been affected? How has this resulted in the ability to meet uh, control objectives or criteria under audit for a SOC 1 or SOC 2 audit? And consequently, the design of controls in which they're operating the way in which controls are being performed, the manner in which people are actually performing that work, and when it comes to the audit, what form of evidence still continues to be maintained or potentially could have gone away that then needs to be reconstructed in order to support the audit. So with these things in mind, a service auditor then would step back and ask some key questions. Does the cumulative effect of all these other changes impact how the audit might be approached. And whether it's the audit period shifting, the uh, window of time in which audit procedures might need to be performed, uh, 
can all have an influence on, on how the audit might be done this year. So if we know a service organization has been affected, understanding those effects can then lead us to some questions like, do we need to come in and do earlier procedures? Does the service organization need to make themselves available for those procedures in order to ensure that different types of control practices can be properly assessed and understood throughout the entire course of the audit as, as practices are changing. If there's been a truncation in business or uh, some other effects, that might influence whether an organization want to have its routine audit period continued or maybe either extending that period to allow it to focus on business operations or shorten that period in order to have cleaner cutoff based upon how operations may be changing at different segments of time. In addition, because of these changes in the controls, it can affect how documentation is available and what form it may be presented. So there's quite a bit of need for understanding how that evidence may have been affected and to adapt both the testing approach and uh, the type of questions of what information, what evidence would be retained. Even to the extent of are the right people available to make evidence um, at the disposal of the auditor and or are they available to perform inquiries and other types of, of uh, observation procedures. And then because of things like uh, remote testing, remote operations, it may be necessary to adapt testing procedures around uh, reperformance, around physical observations, around access to certain records that might be uh, retained on site and might require scanning or other types of access in order to minimize the exposure of different individuals getting together to share evidence and perform testing procedures. And then finally, there could be situations in which there are just um, an erosion of the controls in selected areas that would result in, in disclosure. And both the service organization and the service auditor needing to step back and ask the question, what happened? And how should that be properly presented on the face of the report? So as we, can, as we consider next steps here, it's really important to consider what should a service organization do in order to systematically ensure it's prepared for the audit. And we want to offer here are some really fundamental places to begin. First of all, the risk assessment, the backdrop around what areas of the business um, might be exposed and systematically evaluating those risks to understand the impact. Then, because that system environment, the description of the controls is presented in the report system description, evaluating the potential ways that presentation could have been affected, and then systematically going backwards and ensuring the documentation around the system description is updated to accurately reflect where things stand. We talked about earlier that the evidence and testing procedures can be affected, and that's, that's really relevant to consider early on in order to anticipate and then make sure evidence is available at the right time and the right place for the audit. Now, because both service organizations and service auditors are now uh, heavily working in remote conditions, that can have a direct effect on how field work might be performed, planning, preparation, execution of the audit itself. And we'll talk through some key milestones and key ways in order to make that as successful as possible. We also talked about the service organizations, uh, subservice organizations being potentially impacted and ways to, to incrementally go through and make inquiries of them and talk to them about what um, their impact might be and then to consider how that might influence the audit of the, serv of the service organizations themselves. And then dealing with both exceptions and subsequent events, wanted to make sure that the way in which exceptions are presented are thought through in advance. And then if there are events after the audit period is completed, that could have an impact on the reporting presentation to anticipate those and, and talk up front about how those look. So next we'll shift over. Ravine will talk to us through each of these areas of resulting actions and uh, give us some further guidance. Ravine? Thank you, Chris. Um, so, yes, yeah, like Chris mentioned, um, coronavirus and COVID-19 have, have obviously impacted the business process. 
and uh, in the business environment. And that means, <clears throat> as an enterprise, the types of risks, vulnerabilities, and threats you face have evolved in face of that. For instance, there has been a marked increase in attempts for phishing activity, in attempts on cyber breaches, and so on and so forth. And you really need to, as an enterprise, look back and, and look at your risk assessment and understand whether your risk assessment appropriately accounts for the changes in the business environment caused um, and, and brought about by, by this pandemic. So really, from a risk assessment perspective, um, it would behoove management to review the control changes that need to occur um, in order to address those new risks that might exist as a result of the pandemic. Um, really just revisit the entirety of uh, the risk assessment from a COVID-19 perspective and see if, if that even warrants a supplementary uh, risk assessment that's focused on um, risks um, introduced by the pandemic. You want to make sure, obviously, you have appropriate internal control coverage for those risks um, and also review your ability to continue performing the control activities that were previously defined. Um, this is a key point that we're going to cover a, a couple of different ways, but really um, due to either reduced staffing or changes in business process to account for a remote workforce, um, there can be changes to how controls function and your risk assessment um, review it would be a good opportunity to look at your existing controls and reassess if they continue to operate um, as, as originally envisioned. Um, it's also a good, um, good practice to consider increased fraud risk. Like I mentioned, there, there is increased activity um, from a cyber breach perspective. Cybersecurity risk has gone up. Um, there's also obviously more um, risk exposed from a fraud perspective because of the changes to the workforce and changes to the control environment. And so um, being cognizant of that and, and evaluating adjustments to, to ensure that this appropriate coverage would be, would be uh, beneficial. And if uh, management determines that sufficient mitigating actions have already been taken um, and it doesn't warrant a significant or material change in the risk assessment, then, uh, then you're in a good spot. And that would kind of be the gauge, um, gauge when you're revisiting your risk assessment. Next slide. <clears throat> From a system description perspective, just tactically when you're looking at your SOC report, um, it's a description of your policies, procedures, practices, and controls that define the functioning of your system of internal controls. Um, as changes occur to both the business environment and also um, perhaps to your control activities, um, it would behoove management to look at the system description to evaluate the description criteria and disclosure, define material changes to operations, systems, and controls. Um, now, of these three, um, controls would probably be the most obvious since when you change a control activity, that, that net change needs to be carried through in the entirety of the SOC report from um, system description all the way down to the, the test tables. Um, but then there's other key aspects to this. If you have key and material changes to your operations or your system to account for um, the, the COVID pandemic, you've got to ensure that your system description describes those changes. And even if those are changes that occurred mid-period, mid-examination period, there needs to be clarity and communication to the end user of the report um, with regards to why that change occurred, when that change occurred, and what the nature of that change was. You want to make sure and confirm that the system description remains sufficient, and then, of course, make necessary updates to um, ensure clarity of the report users, like I mentioned. Um, the system description is, at the end of the day, a reflection of your processes, and as those change, you need to ensure that those, those get updated throughout. Again, from a tactical evidence and test procedure perspective, um, and this is in partnership with your um, examiner, your system auditor. Um, you want to make sure that the control changes and adjustments are reflected throughout and they're aware of those changes. Um, you also want to make sure that there's sufficient evidence that remains to, in order to test these controls and the evidence that you have been gathering hasn't been adversely impacted from either a completeness and accuracy standpoint or a frequency of collection standpoint as a result of um, altered business practices. 
You also want to make sure um, that changes to evidence due to changing processes, especially if this occurs midstream during an examination period, um, are accounted for. You've got to account for the way the control function for part of the period and then account for the changed functioning of that control activity for the remaining part of that period and obtain and retain um, sufficient and appropriate evidence for both aspects of it. And of course, um, the pandemic could adversely affect um, your, your, not only the collection of your data and your evidence, but also the timing of your test procedures. Um, you would have to collaborate and work with your examiner to ensure um, that those, those changes in the timing of your test procedures work for both of you in terms of business cycle, also the examination um, itself. And if there's any need for alternative or additional test steps that need to be added in, um, that might have been either identified um, by your service auditor or identified as part of your control activity analysis as part of your risk assessment, that would be a good, um, good aspect, a good point to bring up um, during your conversations with your service auditor as well. Of course, with, uh, with curbs on travel and, and generally, uh, um, gathering in, 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 in offices for the most part throughout uh, the country, um, it would make sense to be in communication with your service auditor early to ensure that the remote testing strategy, if one is to be used, um, remains effective. Um, going from performing on-site procedures to a remote testing strategy involves certain changes to both ends. Um, both the evidence collection end and then obviously the examination end of it as well. And so it makes sense to have open and clear communication early on set expectations and develop a clear audit schedule with each control owner and also the examiner. Ensure there's sufficient evidence, um, like I'd mentioned previously, to support your control activities, um, the control activities that existed prior to COVID or any of the change control activities that were either put in place to address risks or modified um, to address for changes in, in process. With remote testing, you would need to allow for additional lead time and monitor closely, especially as your control um, owners are now geographically in different spots potentially uh, versus all being together in the same office or perhaps there's an impact from the perspective of um, you have a scheduled management meeting or a board meeting that now has to occur remotely. How do we capture minutes? How do we ensure that we have um, complete control coverage over that aspect of things? Um, have we talked through all the mechanics of how we gather that evidence and retain it? Um, you will have to potentially employ secure portals to transmit evidence. This is thing, uh, one thing that most, uh, most examiners and oddities are, are used to doing at this point, but if this is something new for you, um, then it would, it would be a good idea to have that conversation early on so we have the right mechanism in place to transfer that data. Use video conferencing um, for, for interviews, observations, and walkthroughs um, in certain situations where um, travel um, is obviously um, curtailed. You have the ability to rely and leverage um, on video conferencing technology to ensure that there's, there's appropriate evidence for, uh, for certain controls. And of course, you want to maintain um, a periodic touch point with your examiner and both internally as well with your key control owners and stakeholders to ensure that appropriate um, evidence gathering practices and, um, and, and also to ensure that the overall project is, uh, is on track and is, the changes due to the remote testing strategy are accounted for in that, in that conversation. From a subservice organization perspective, if your business relies on subservice organizations, which the easiest way to think of this would be a critical vendor whose input into your overall system or service is critical for the delivery of that service. Um, if you have any type of um, an infrastructure as a service provider, um, popular ones being Azure or AWS, for instance, um, you might have to consider the impact that this pandemic has on your subservice provider and the impact that that has on your ability to demonstrate appropriate controls coverage. 
Now, <clears throat> there might be a need to perform supplemental monitoring procedures as a result of um, the additional risk for um, in introduced by, by COVID. Um, for carve-out method, which is where we rely on your subservice provider to uh, provide um, some sort of a third-party adaptation report, typically another SOC report, um, covering their uh, control environment and internal control activities, um, you might have to have conversations earlier than usual with them to ensure that you have an understanding and, and have visibility into the types of changes and the and the magnitude of changes that they're making to their SOC report that might impact your SOC report. Now, in instances where you have an inclusive method where your service examiner or your service auditor actually goes and looks at um, the, the processes and control activities at your subservice provider, um, you might have to have even more involved conversations with them to not only account for uh, potentially having to do this remotely, now imagine having to do remote testing two layers in when you're looking at the subservice, but then also um, make sure that there's no resulting scope limitation or disclosures that might be needed as a result of changes that the subservice might have made to, to overcome um, the, the pandemic and its impact. So in a nutshell, it's important to understand and have conversations with your subservice provider early on to ensure the impact um, that their service and their subservice might have on yours um, is, is fully understood. And if there is a soft report that they're gonna be furnishing to you, that you understand the changes that they're making to those, including any changes to the complementary user entity controls so that you can account for those through uh, appropriate controls coverage internally. Now, from an exceptions perspective, uh, it's pretty clear that there's gonna be control activity changes that might stem from, from COVID. What we need to be careful about is if there are any test failures that originate due to COVID, what are their impacts? And you've got to work closely with, with your examiner to make sure that uh, you're evaluating the impact that it has on either the criteria or the control objective. Um, and, and also understand whether that, that exception exists for the entirety of the examination period or only for a part of the examination period. So those are key critical conversations. Um, nobody, nobody wants to have a surprise at the end of, of an examination, and therefore it's important to, to have periodic touch points um, internally to ensure the controls are functioning appropriately, but also with your examiner to ensure that if there are changes or chances that there's gonna be an exception that you have, uh, you're retaining the appropriate amount of evidence to demonstrate that the control was at least effective for part of the period. And so there's a fair line in the sand there and, and, and there's strategies to consider. Now, you might consider uh, disclosure of conditions that produce the exception. Um, this could be um, the loss of key personnel um, due to uh, furloughs, due to reduced workload or anything of that sort. Um, again, you know, impact that you need to discuss with your, with your um, service auditor to ensure that those are appropriately captured in, um, in the final report. Um, and then of course, proactively develop responses to these exceptions. Um, and this can, be, this can be an ongoing thing as, as situational changes occur that cause additional business changes. There might be instances where the initial management response evolves over time as, as mitigating factors are presented and are put in place. And so as that occurs, it's appropriate to, uh, to not only have uh, the initial discussion and come up with a management response for any exceptions that might have occurred, but to continue to monitor those to see if there are additional changes that need to be introduced to that management response. In terms of subsequent events, um, if subsequent events occur, um, you would need to have additional disclosures or testing. Subsequent event is typically an event that occurs um, after the examination period or before the issuance of the report. Um, this may or may not include system description uh, changes. Um, it could impact your examination period or the formal reporting, um, especially if the subsequent events relate to your ability to continue as a business or have a material impact on your ability to sustain the business. Um, financial viability procedures are not explicitly part of an SOC examination. 
However, if there's material financial liability concerns, then we need to evaluate um, appropriate disclosures that may, to be, may need to be included in the report itself. And so again, uh, maintaining that level of communication and transparency with your service auditor um, in this particular case would, uh, would be beneficial because um, it allows you to have, um, have foresight into what may or may not need to occur in order to issue a SOC report despite subsequent events. And with that, um, I think we've covered the seven key points. I'm going to hand it over to Jared to talk through some of the next steps. Thanks, Ravine. So we just covered a lot of information around uh, how an organization can really um, assess the impact of COVID, and we wanted to provide some really succinct uh, next steps for an organization to follow that they can actually put some action in action into the process here and, and really understanding some of those impacts. Um, you know, the first step really would be, as we discussed, reviewing uh, those impacts to your business, uh, the system controls, uh, really determine if there are other reporting factors that should be considered through going through the risk assessment process and really doing an introspective look at how this may have impacted your, your organization and your control environment uh, and those control activities that are being performed. Um, you know, with that uh, information, taking that and then looking at your system description, understanding if there are uh, changes that need to be made in that system description. Have there been additional controls that have been put into place due to having a remote workforce or other types of uh, organizational changes? Um, understanding if there are additional risks that should be discussed in that system description. Uh, really making sure that it's clear uh, to your reader about how you're addressing those risks and what those risks might be. Uh, next one is really just taking a very tactical approach and looking at understanding if uh, there is a need to adjust your audit period due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Have there been things that have occurred that will cause a spike in activity that may need you to focus your efforts, uh, efforts on the business operation side and adjust that audit period to a later time when your staff and uh, organization has time to go through the steps of an audit. Uh, could there be reasons to bring that audit forward to account for various changes that you want your uh, people relying on your SOC report to know and understand about your business? Um, so really assessing that, determining if there are uh, needs to make adjustments to that. Uh, next step could be really evaluating if there have been um, any changes to your ability to really obtain uh, sufficient audit evidence, um, really understanding some of those impacts around staffing and other things that could cause uh, or result in a lack of ability to retain sufficient audit evidence and really understanding um, what that can mean from a controls activity perspective and uh, as Ravine mentioned, how that might impact your control objectives or the criteria. Um, you know, once you've kind of gone through these steps, really understanding, do we need to communicate with our customers uh, proactively and really uh, talking to them and understanding if there's going to be, um, you know, exceptions that occur, talking to them early about what those look like and, and what those results might be. Uh, certainly from an audit timing perspective, if there's going to be changes, helping them understand why those changes are needed in that timing and help them understand how you've been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and the steps that you're taking uh, due to this pandemic. Uh, next here, really taking a look at policies, procedures, other type of internal documentation that you have, understanding if there need to be updates and making sure that those are still in line with your current processes and activities, uh, making sure that those uh, policies and procedures are uh, available to staff uh, who are working remotely where they might have had physical access before, uh, do they still have access to that documentation? Next is really just doing a quick uh, determination if there are any management representation letter updates um, that need to be made as a result uh, of the pandemic and, and changes to uh, your control environment or the timing. And then finally, the culmination of all this is really understanding uh, how you might need to tailor and adapt the audit process uh, based on your situation. Um, communicating early on with your service auditor to make sure that they understand uh, 
the needs of your business and your organization and working with them on how they might best position you to uh, complete the SOC report and get your uh, SOC report to the market while still uh, maintaining your uh, control environment and other things that you need to. With that, I think we're going to uh, go on to our conclusion here and we'll turn it back to Chris Cradgen. Great, Jared, and thanks for being, really appreciate everybody's time today to have a moment to reflect back upon uh, how SOC reporting may be impacted by the coronavirus. And uh, what we really wanted to do today was to walk through a good framework to reflect on what might be considered material changes operationally that could affect controls and the business. And in turn, the cascading effect that could have on the SOC reporting for a service organization. We've, we've walked through today a variety of areas in which uh, that impact can be assessed, whether from the risk assessment and the system reporting, uh, and then looking even further down the path of how that could take into account around the method of evidence that you collect, the way in which you might even need to uh, make sure that evidence is retained and available for the audit. And then from a practical standpoint, remote testing procedures that can be performed in order to overcome uh, social distancing and remote workforce situations under the current conditions. And even, uh, even considering how physical testing procedures might need to be adapted. Because the service organization is in fact working with subservice organizations, wanting to look further out at the associated uh, impact of the subservice organizations and their vendors and how that takes into account within the overall system description and risk assessment uh, that's been performed. Finally, because um, there can be some very unusual exceptions in subsequent events associated with coronavirus and its impact on a service organization, really wanting to reflect on that early and then take into account how that can affect the reporting, report presentation, wording, and overall um, communication out to the market. So we hope you found this information very helpful and look forward to being available should you have any follow-up questions. So on behalf of myself, Chris Cradgen, Ravine Bersin, and Jared James, we just wanna thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.